Welcome everyone. My name is Renee Moncada and I am one of the two facilitators today. Today we also have Alicia Garza who is joining me and uh, Dr. White for the session to co-facilitate. And we also have as our interpreters today, Chelsea and Sierra. So you'll find them on your screen. Uh, this session is being recorded. Your attendance is tracked via the participants report generated by Zoom. We are not taking attendance via chat. <clears throat> Please remember to mute your microphones as a courtesy to our speaker today. Um, and that will eliminate the background noise um, that sometimes can interfere. Please feel free to leave your questions in the chat uh, box section and raise your hand um, as we do the Q&A at the end. Uh, Dr. White will be presenting today um, on a very, very important topic uh, that's near and dear to me, as well as I know that you will appreciate the words that she's going to share with us. The title of this, conf uh, this workshop is um, Promoting Equity and Managing Bias. Um, I know our keynote spoke a little, high, uh, a little bit about it, um, but Dr. White, I think, is going to really um, emphasize what that truly means. Dr. Tiffany White is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's a researcher and educator born and raised in the Central Valley. Her personal mission is to increase awareness and develop the knowledge and skills of professionals to promote equity in different dimensions of American society. Dr. White has extensive experience working with individuals who are diagnosed with severe mental illnesses and co-occurring substance disorders, as well as holding leadership roles in which she advocates for reducing disparities in behavioral health and education by promoting equity. Those roles have allowed Dr. White to use her privilege to advocate for student autonomy and empowerment so that each individual has the ability to work toward their own personal academic and professional goals. It's my personal pleasure to now to introduce you to Dr. Tiffany White. Dr. White. Thank you so much, Renee. I appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I am going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. All right, does everyone see my screen okay? Awesome, okay. So let's just jump into it. So the outcomes of today's session is that I hope that by um, participating in this session that you'll understand equity principles, equity-minded principles, you'll be able to identify and, and accept that implicit bias is a normal human function. Um, but we wanna understand that implicit bias can have an impact. Um, on our students and the people that we serve. Um, I hope to give you some literature and tools that we can manage implicit bias and the impact that it has on our students. And then I want to provide you some information on trauma-informed perspectives as a means of managing those biases and that impact. All right, so I really wanted to center this conversation. Um, I, as Renee had mentioned earlier, um, I think one of the reasons that I was asked to come and speak into this, um, this symposium is just because um, I do teach a dual enrollment course at the Juvenile Justice Center here in Fresno. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to do is when this, when we first started talking about this symposium a year ago before everything happened with the pandemic, um, I was asked to present and I was like, what, what information could I have, you know? And so um, I asked my students, you know, you guys are really the experts on this. What information would you want a pro professionals who are working with you to know? Um, about you and how they can promote your success. And so we put up big post-it notes and we gave them all uh, some markers and we gave them all an opportunity to just mention some of the things that they wanted everyone to know. Um, so on the screen, you see some of the quotes of some of the things that the students said. Um, and these students, because it is a dual enrollment college course, um, are everywhere from um, about 16 to 18 years old. I think there's been a few 15 year olds. Um, so a couple have said, 
You know, I feel like people are waiting for me to mess up. It makes me mess up. I'm not a bad kid. I've just been in some bad situations. Um, sometimes when people get attitude with me, I get attitude with them. I know I shouldn't, but I can't help it. Um, I can feel people waiting for me to fail. I wish that they would notice when I do good things too. So that's actually one of the things that we have that happens regularly in that class um, is that people say that, you know, they can feel people waiting for them to mess up. And so um, as many times as they don't take opportunities to mess up, you know, they arise from it. Everyone only focuses on the one time that they mess up. Um, some of my students said, I feel like I'm smart, but most adults don't feel that way. It brings me down. Um, this is the first time someone noticed I was good at something in school. I never thought I could be good in school. I just need support. Where I grew up, there was no support. I don't know how to be successful on my own. And I struggle with staying motivated because I've already made so many mistakes. So it would be nice if someone could help me with that. So I just really wanted to center the conversation about some of the implicit biases that these students have about professionals and adults in their lives um, have about them. So today's meeting is largely about implicit bias. And so what is implicit bias? And, you know, I'm sure most of the people who are attending this, this uh, presentation already know what implicit bias is. Um, we're talking about unconscious preferences. They're involuntary and they're inevitable. And so in our evolutionary past, they may have served us to survive, right? And so if I ate a flower and it made me sick to my stomach, I'm not gonna eat that flower again, right? So we, we adapt and we collect different kinds of, in um, the field of psychology, we call them schemas, right? And so it's different kinds of learning that we do that's purely based on our experiences. And it creates, um, it, it prepares us for how we act in the future. And so they're normal part of human development. Unconscious bias is not racist, it is not discriminatory, it is not prejudiced. Um, it can absolutely have an impact. Um, so we're talking about preferences, right, that we have based on our experiences. Um, if it goes unmanaged, it can lead to discrimination. It is not explicitly that, but it can absolutely lead to discrimination. It can lead to prejudice. Um, but that is not what implicit bias is. And so um, as we move throughout this training, I want you to think about some of the biases that you might have. Um, so one of the things that we have to talk about if we're talking about implicit bias is stereotypes, right? And so stereotypes are thoughts about different groups. And so as we go throughout life, we collect different kinds of messages about what people are, what these groups mean. Um, and I just, I'm so sorry to the interpreter. I just realized I'm talking really fast. I'm going to try to slow down. Um, so I really like um, talking about Raiders fans. And so I grew up in a Steelers household. Um, and so we um, had a lot of, I grew up with a lot of assumptions about Raiders fans, right? And so um, I have uncles who are Raiders fans. Um, they did got a bad rap in my house, right? And so um, I don't know about everyone else's implicit bias, but mine personally, I had a lot of judgments about what Raider fans meant, you know? Um, and so prejudice is feelings about another group. And so I grew up thinking that, you know, Raiders fans were very rude, you know, just because of the assumptions that were attached to the group of Raiders fans. Um, and so I would stay away from Raiders fans, right? And so if we ever went to a football game, um, my, my family would say, you know, stay away from those Raiders fans because they can get rowdy, right? And so that, that is behavior, that is discrimination, right? Um, so I'm actually changing away, I'm changing the way that I act based on my feelings and thoughts about these particular groups, right? So of course, the discrimination, the behavior can have a lifelong effect if it's something that is, for example, you know, our formerly incarcerated students. If we have thoughts about what that means to be formerly incarcerated um, and feelings about what that means, we can absolutely have an impact that disadvantages that group if it's negative, of course, right? Um, one of the things that we'll talk about is that um, we have preferences for groups that we are already a part of. And so this is something why we need formerly incarcerated people who are in uh, leadership roles in our different dimensions of society, because guess what? They might see those people as part of their group and they might actually benefit them, right? And so their feelings and their thoughts uh, might not be negative, and so the impact is different. All right, so let's 
So, and then we have to talk about trauma. Um, of course, I'm a therapist, and so I have to throw it in here. Um, trauma is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience, right? Um, it can be anything from acute, chronic, and complex. Um, we actually make those diagnoses um, in the mental health field, and all it means really, and your your um, your diagnosis is just really just telling us what that trauma means and what it does for you. Um, trauma can impact your implicit bias hugely. Um, it will can part of a PTSD diagnosis that's post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis really means that you're you are avoiding situations that you have been in before that caused you discomfort, right? And so if I was in a life or death situation um, at a grocery store, I'm going to have some trouble going to that grocery store every single time that I go, right? So I might avoid going to the grocery store completely because of that trauma that occurred. Um, so we see this in different things, in different ways, um, but it absolutely impacts your implicit bias. All right. So I'm going to leave this on the screen for a moment, but I just want to talk about intent versus impact it's because I know that a lot of well-intentioned people um, think that implicit bias isn't something that has an impact on their students, right? And so I just wanna say that if we do not manage our own implicit bias, if we do not become aware of how, what our biases are and don't even just recognize the impact that it could potentially have on these different groups, um, we may be in unintentionally having a negative impact on the groups that we serve. Um, so the difference between intent and impact um, it does not equate to each other, right? And so um, in this little comic book, um, this girl spilled coffee on someone in the elevator and her intent, she's expressing, I didn't mean to spill it on you. I was just in a hurry because I'm late for class and she's going on and on and on and explaining her intentions while this guy is over here waiting for an apology, right? Whereas if she would have just led with her apology and said, um, I should have paid attention to, and I imagine how you're feeling, I'm so sorry, right? Um, it allows us to reflect and say, okay, at least she understood where she's wrong. Um, the impact is different, right? Uh, so again, just keeping in mind that our intent is not equal to the impact that we have. All right. So I just kind of wanted to take a critical glance at how implicit bias can impact different dimensions of our society. So specifically our criminal justice system. This is something that implicit bias can absolutely be a factor. And so we know um, there is a lot of data that indicates that black indigenous people of color are disproportionately stopped and arrested. Um, we know that um, that is largely due to um, something called racial profiling, which is implicit bias um, that is, you know, it used to be taught, right? I don't think, it, I don't know if it is taught so much more, um, but it is something that is, uh, definitely has an impact on our community and our society at large, right? Um, there is a lot of um, things in the media right now about some of the violence that has happened because of implicit bias, right? Assumptions that have been made um, as far as, you know, potential violence, right? So we will go into it a little bit more in our next, uh, in our next uh, slide. And it's basically that um, our implicit bias impacts what we perceive as potential, right? And so in the sentencing process, when judge sees per persons, research indicates that white people are judged and perceived on their basis of potential for success, right? whereas black indigenous people of color are judged um, on their potential for crime. So think about how those different things and those different assumptions that I'm making can have an impact on sentencing, how long you're gonna stay there, um, you know, what kinds of things um, I'm going to ask you to participate in. Um, it has an impact, absolutely, right? Um, and I just want to talk about secondary trauma a little bit. So one of the things that happens is when we see these messages in the media all the time about, you know, um, Black people are regularly being murdered by the police, right? That has an impact on people who look like that, who are watching those messages, right? 
Um, so I see a lot of people from my community, from the Black community, taking social media breaks because they are tired of seeing um, Black bodies being murdered and mutilated in, uh, in the media. Um, that is a secondary trauma. I did not personally experience that, but it is impacting me, right? Think about the impact on a, in a real life level, right? So if I am driving down the street, I'm taking a social media break because I'm tired of seeing so many black people murdered in, in film. I am driving down the street and a police officer pulls me over. What impact is that gonna have, right? I'm impacted. Um, in, this, in the mental health field, we regularly have conversations about um, therapists who want to diagnose members of the black community with delusional disorders or a psychotic disorder because they have not personally impact, they have not personally been impacted um, by uh, law enforcement, but they are having, they're regularly feeling anxious, they are regularly feeling, you know, upset, discomfort because they are worried that this might happen to someone that they love, right? Um, so there's all kinds of biases that can happen and that can have an impact on the things that we do. I also um, want to call out about police officers, right? Um, so I also um, previously worked with law enforcement uh, to do psychiatric evaluations in the field. So I would write 5150 folds um, with law enforcement and it impacts them as well, right? And so they are very hypersensitive a lot of times to, you know, I want to be sure that I'm doing this above the board, you know, they get anxious, it impacts them as well, right? And so they un fully understand that every time we see something in the media that someone is gonna be, might be more anxious, right? And so I have to be on my P's and Q's about this. Um, and so it has a com compounded impact, right? Every time we're getting these messages every day. And so all I'm getting across is that we just gotta recognize the impact that it has. Um, William Cox actually calls out for every person who confirms a bias, it takes three to disconfirm a stereotype to balance it out, right? So every time you see one of the stereotypes that you already hold, uh, it takes three, three, stereo, uh, three people, three different kinds of experiences to balance that out that do not go towards that stereotype. And so I already discussed it in mental health, right? Misdiagnosis, inappropriate care, removal of rights. So that's the 5150 hold, the psychiatric, um, it's a legal document that removes people's rights to get them psychiatric care, right? And so the problem is, is that if I am taking a approach where it is, I believe that I know what's in the best interest of this person um, and not understanding that my bias might be impacting that, then I could take someone's rights away because I don't have the messages that I need. I don't have a full understanding of this group, right? Um, so, we often see that people who have mental illness end up in the justice system. Um, we often see that people who um, have formerly participated in the justice system um, get diagnosed uh, with misdiagnosis. There's just not an understanding of what it is that they need, right? Just because what, um, what we found is that there's a thing called clinical clinician efficacy. And what that is, is a clinician may or may not use a whole person approach in understanding what it is that their client needs, right? So a whole person approach is really just understanding and meeting with your, the individual that you're serving and understanding what it is that they're wanting from care. So, oh, you're saying that you are anxious, you are worried about your kids, you are worried about, you know, um, you are having nightmares all the time, you're just constant worrying. I'm gonna help you with that worry because that's something that you're identifying, right? Whereas someone who is taking the expert opinion, I'm the expert, um, I think actually you're delusional about those things because that never happened to you personally. So I'm actually gonna treat a delusional disorder, right? Um, so that impacts different kinds of things. Uh, that impacts the kind of care that you're gonna get. You may not wanna come back anymore because I'm not meeting your needs, right? You, you didn't even worry about the things that I came for. Um, and I also want to highlight that, uh, People who participate in the justice system are more likely to receive uh, psychiatric medications. And so uh, think about all of these things in combination. So if a person is receiving, while they are currently incarcerated um, and they're receiving psychotropic medications, but we gave them a misdiagnosis and we're giving them the wrong medications, how successful are they gonna be? 
How successful are they going to be when they get out and they continue that medication and they're trying to be a successful college student at Fresno City College, right? Uh, the medications that they have aren't working for them. It's making them feel distracted. It's not helping them. Um, how is that going to impact their success? And then finally, we have child welfare services. Um, and this is because a lot of our foster youth are disproportionately um, involved in a justice system, right? And so we know that research indicates that Black Indigenous people of color are more likely to be removed. Um, there is a disproportionate number of Black Indigenous people of color and LGBTQ children in the foster system. Um, and we know that it is more difficult for Black Indigenous people of color and their families to be brought back together. Um, and it's difficult to place these children into loving and affirming families. Um, and we know that 30% of foster children who are entering the justice system are placement related behavioral health issues. So again, thinking about this from a perspective of implicit bias, uh, if I know that, you know, we are normalizing uh, removal and involvement in these different systems to these children, right? Um, and so how is that gonna impact their future? You know, what kind of messages are they getting? and How are we shaping their implicit bias? In education, we know that, um, or we have found in research that Black Indigenous people of color are disproportionately suspended and expelled. There is an academic achievement gap, which we know is largely due to implicit bias and assumptions about who needs some additional help. Um, we also have teacher expectations that change based on implicit bias. And we have chronic absenteeism that is a result. Um, we have disproportionate impact where that is emotional disturbance diagnosis and advanced placement courses is largely up to the professionals working with these students, right? So if we have uh, school uh, counselors, and we have academic counselors who are making that determination about who gets to be in that AP class, who is getting that ED diagnosis. Um, we have to be very aware of those implicit biases that are at play, right? Is this actually emotional disturbance diagnosis or is this someone who was in their environment that uh, they're doing very, very well given, their, given that own person's history? Um, and so it's just something that, to be aware of and that implicit bias and how it's impacting the student. Um, so Georgetown did a study and they researched um, a bunch of different teachers, counselors, professionals at different kinds of schools, and they found that um, there's this concept called adultification that happens with Black children, um, specifically um, with Black girls. They found that when compared to white girls of the same age, um, adults surveyed believe that Black girls need less nurturing, less protection, to be supported less, comforted less. They're more independent, they know more about adult topics, and they know more about sex. So thinking about implicit bias and the impact that it can have, what, what kinds of things would change? What would be my route for discipline or for nurturing? Um, if I was a professional working with these girls, right? And so this is for the girls ages four through 10. Um, so again, the reason that they did this study is because they found that there was a huge discrepancy. It was very disproportionate for black girls facing disciplinary actions um, in this specific school, a couple of school districts on the East Coast. Um, and so they found that they're having this concept called adultification. They're adultifying these little girls, right? So they see them as adults. That is why they're giving them more disciplinary actions. And so this is something that happens, right? Um, if we see a little person or a little uh, children or even you know, some of the teens that I work with um, as adults who are fully capable of making adult decisions, then we are going to hold them accountable and the consequences might be more harsh. Um, and so understanding that these are kids that we're talking about. These are kids that we're working with that implicit bias is gonna have an impact on their futures forever. Um, and that is part of what is the school to prison pipeline, right? If we are regularly having these messages, if they're regularly experiencing discipline, we are preparing them not for success in college systems, not for success in higher ed. We are preparing them for success 
in the justice system. We are preparing them for prison. We are preparing them for jail. We are preparing them to be incarcerated, right? Um, and this graphic just kind of goes into some of the, the, um, the data that is related to um, the different kinds of disciplinary actions that happens in school system. Um, again, I, I just want to call to the intersectionality of um, Black, Indigenous, people of color are the ones who there's implicit bias, of course, in both school, in the foster care system, in mental health, and in incarceration. So there is a compounded impact, right? So imagine if you were um, someone who identifies from all of these groups, right? So I'm a foster kid, I am Black, I am LGBTQ, and um, I have all of these different things that people will see, you know, should I share that I'm LGBTQ with my teachers if this is something that um, might be held against me? So the problem is, is that trauma, if I'm regularly experiencing disciplinary actions, if I'm regularly um, experiencing situations where I am concerned about my well-being or my life, we have situations where people are removed from their house and they're put in foster care and they, they experience a trauma, right? Um, that impacts behavioral, that impacts your behaviors and learning. So your ability to learn is, is, um, is correlated with trauma, right? Um, and so just thinking about how different kids get to school and the things that they have to pass and the traumas that they may experience on their way to school um, may have an impact on how they're gonna be able to learn that day. So what I wanted to say is that we, we don't need allies for this, for this work, right? We need accomplices. And the difference between the two words is I think that ally has become a very nice buzzword that signifies, you know, I'm friendly to that group. I'm going to be someone who is going to be supportive to that group. We need action. We need accomplices, right? So we need people who are going to practice radical self-care and reflect on the things that they are doing um, and how they can impact these communities positively. Um, we can do it in every dimension that we are working in currently. So again, I'm a therapist. Um, I do work in education. There's so many different things that I can do today right now um, to make sure to, number one, manage my implicit bias, and number two, um, promote equity for the students that we serve. So how do we effectively manage our implicit bias, right? And so number one is becoming aware of it. Um, we're going to go into that a little bit more in detail. There's increasing your exposure to different groups. There's different skills that you can increase. And then also um, being aware of minimal group impact. Um, so your awareness of your biases is effective in reducing the impact temporarily. Um, so as we are going through this conversation, if you are actually thinking about the implicit biases and the preferences that you hold about different groups, you actually might be impact that you have of your implicit bias. So you just being aware of it, that you have biases, um, you might be reducing that impact, that negative impact potential, right? Um, so just take a moment and think about it. What, what implicit biases or what biases might you have about students that identify as formerly incarcerated? What does that mean to you? What messages do you get? If the student says, you know, hey, I'm formerly incarcerated, or if you get a message, they didn't tell you, but you, you knew that you had some formerly incarcerated students in your class, how might you move forward knowing that information, right? So think about that. Um, think about the ways that you would, you would move forward or that you might impact that student in a way that would either um, increase their success, their potential for success, or decrease it. So there are actual tools that you can go and identify your implicit, um, your implicit bias and your unconscious preferences. Um, I'm sure that most people have heard about the IAT. Um, I did do previous research with Harvard as far as the IAT. Um, we, what I did was um, I researched clinician perspectives of the Black individuals that they served. And so I wanted to see, number one, 
what their racial preferences were, and number two, what were their perceptions of effectiveness in the, in the field? And so um, the people in my research study actually took the IAT, the Implicit Association Test, related to the race one, and then um, they answered a qual qualitative question that just asked them, how do you know you're being effective with the, the people that you're serving? And so what we found was that people who had um, a strong preference for European Americans that were working with black clients um, tended to have an expert opinion on what that client needed, right? And so they're not listening to the black client that comes in with them. They're inserting what they believe is the, in the best interest of the individuals, the black individuals that they're serving. Um, and so this has a huge impact on the services that we provide. So we know that for black individuals, um, there is a high dropout rate, right? They tend to not complete services, right? And so what happens is during an assessment is that people will often leave and never come back to counseling services. And so um, we might, th we think that some of that is due to implicit bias. Um, so you can even go to the Project Implicit website and take a whole bunch of different kinds of IATs. Um, again, I did the race one. The race one is binary, I will give it that. Um, so for the one that I use, it would only focus on black and white faces. Um, it does not advise against a propensity for racism. Again, if you get a strongly uh, preference for strong European or a preference for a strong preference for African American, it doesn't mean you're racist. It doesn't mean that you discriminate. It doesn't mean that you prejud you're prejudiced against any of these groups. It's just telling you what um, your unconscious preferences are. And it's really just a reflection of the people that you've been around, right? Um, so there's a whole bunch of them that you can complete. There's some on age, there's some on sexuality, there's a few on religion, um, there's some on weight and body size. Um, they're regularly adding to those IATs. Um, and if you know, if you've gone through it before, it's just basically asking you to group certain words with both positive and negative connotations, excuse me, um, with different uh, faces that are, I'll go back. Those, those are some of the faces that are included in the race IAT. And so you see a face pop up and you're supposed to um, both group it with either, um, positive or negative words on the screen. All right. So you might be asking, okay, so I know my biases, now what? What do I do, right? What do I do with that? So if you are given a, a score and you see that you have a strong preference for either way, um, you might get some information about where you need to increase your exposure, right? And so I might need to incorporate some more media that includes positive images of other groups. Um, into my Netflix circle or into, you know, my social circle. Um, diversifying your social circle is a huge, is a huge opportunity to discuss and learn from different people. Um, it gives you the opportunity to reach out and have any questions that you have. And I just want to say with, with the exception of not relying on marginalized groups to do your education for you. Um, so just knowing that, you know, I have this friend, I feel really connected, connect, I feel a connection with them, and I want to get to know more about their experience. Um, that can actually uh, impact your implicit bias. Um, but again, not relying on them to do your education for you. They are not the speakers of you know, racism, homophobia, all of these different isms that happen. So Doing that research on your own is fine as well. So there's different books out there that you can do to increase your exposure. It doesn't necessarily have to be media. You can go and meet different people. If you have coworkers um, who you just wanna make a connection with um, just so that you can increase your exposure so that you can um, impact your implicit bias and change it a little bit. So again, we tend to favor people who are similar to ourselves. Um, it's normal. We're gonna to go to people who we want to, who we identify with, right? And so someone I find as similar to myself or who's been through similar experiences, I'm gonna to tend to gravitate towards them. That's part of it. That's part of implicit bias as well. Um, so I think that one of the things that we have to do is figure out a way to connect with people who aren't in any of the groups that we identify with. And so in counseling, how we do this is that 
I may not be able to identify with that specific experience, but I can definitely identify with that feeling, right? I have felt that way before. Um, so just trying to change the way that you perceive the information or even just finding a way that you can connect with people who you wouldn't typically connect with. It can have an, a positive impact on your implicit bias. And then that can have an impact on the impact that you have, right? So a trauma-informed pedagogy uh, is something that I really wanted to just put in here because I think it is something that can have a huge impact on the individuals that we serve. So moving from a place of what is wrong with you to what happened to you, right? That whole thought process can change how you perceive a student. Um, and so understanding that students go through different things as they come to school, they go through different things and I'm talking not just about like um, our youth, I'm talking about, you know, we have comeback students at Fresno City who are, you know, elderly or who have, are coming back after years of not coming to school. And we don't know their experiences. We don't know if this is something that, you know, is, is, has been a very, a huge barrier, how many barriers they have to go through to get here. And so just acknowledging that they may have gone through things that I am not aware of, um, and understanding that you want to provide that support rather than, you know, have these expectations. And then if they reach them, they don't, you know, understanding that everyone is coming from a different place and being supportive and nurturing their success. Um, so this is a poem by Joshua Dickerson. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone has read it. I will go ahead and read it for people um, who may not be able to see it. Um, I woke up, I woke myself up because we ain't got an alarm clock. Dug in the dirty clothes basket because ain't nobody washed my uniform. Brushed my hair and teeth in the dark because the lights ain't on. Even got my baby sister ready because my mama wasn't home. Got us both to school on time to eat us a good breakfast. Then when I got to class, the teacher fussed because I ain't got no pencil. So again, this is echoing the experiences that my, my uh, students in the Juvenile Justice Center had expressed, right? And so I make, I had so many opportunities to mess up. I rose above it. Nobody even recognizes that I did that, right? They only focus on what I've done wrong. Um, nobody has ever highlighted that like I got my baby sister ready. I got us both to school on time. I made sure that we came here dressed. It's, you don't have a pencil, right? Um, so just understanding that people are coming from different places and their experiences are way different. So as it relates to trauma, would you approach these two differently? Would you possibly um, have different feelings about these two students? You know, if we know that one student is former military um, and we know that one student is formerly incarcerated, would we have different perceptions about how we move forward with those students, right? Um, that answer may be revealing something about your implicit bias, your unconscious preferences that you may have, right? Um, so just understanding that every single person that we come into contact with has a story that we may not be aware of. And they may have come over some barriers um, that we don't know how hard it was for them to get here, right? Um, and it, my students tell me some things and it's just like, I don't know that I would be as, uh, happy, you come to class with a smile on your face and you tell me some of the things that you've been through and I'm just like, how? You have no idea, like how, what is a good word? Resilient you are. And that resilience will forever benefit you, right? Um, you've been through so much adversity. Some of these students, these kids are 16 years old and have gone through more things in life than some of the other people that I work with, right? Um, and that's true for a lot of our formerly incarcerated students, not, not just the kids, right? Um, even just during this pandemic, I know that a couple of my students have, during the process of them being in the class and being incarcerated, have become foster kids, right? Because their parents passed away because of COVID, right? And so just understanding, you know, they're going to be late with their assignment because they're mourning, they're going through some grief right now, they're still quarantined, they can't come out of their classroom, they've been stuck there for two months, right? Um, I have students who have um, given birth in the juvenile justice center, saw their, their child briefly, and then came back and wasn't able to see their newborn for a while, um, and started having some behavioral problems, right? And it's like, well, 
you know, we don't know if we're going to let her go back and visit her kid uh, because she hasn't been acting right. It's like, wait, who are we punishing here? What's the point? You know, it's not going to benefit neither the student or the baby if we don't allow her to see the baby, right? And it's like cause and effect. How would you feel if you didn't get to see your newborn? You know, I definitely have some behavioral problems too, you know? Um, and so just understanding that we go through different things and, you know, we, a lot of times we hold students to expectations that, you know, we wouldn't even be able to rise to on our, on our own selves. And so um, I have to be very aware of like, I am a therapist. I have all of these schools in my disposal. Um, yes, I would be able to manage my emotions, but I can't expect that of everyone else. Not everyone is a therapist. Not everyone has cognitive behavioral therapy tools in their workshop, you know? And so just understanding that students are gonna react differently. Maybe they'll be able to rise to that occasion. Maybe they're not. Maybe that missed assignment means that we need to reach out and do some additional um, support and ask them, you know, are you understanding everything? Is there something that I can do to help you better meet the needs? You know, cause you've been a great writer. And so that's, that's one of the other things that I've been um, fortunate enough to see in my experience at the Juvenile Justice Center is that these kids can write. Like I know that it's like um, something that they have a lot of time to do, particularly right now with the pandemic, but very talented and just like evoking the emotion that they've gone through, you know, in their writing skills. And I'm just like, you have no idea how talented you are, you know? And so when you find something that they're good at, just highlighting that and, you know, because again, they don't always have that opportunity to be told that they're good at something. And I think that one of the things that happens in education is that we expect it, right? I expect you to be a good writer. You're here, you're in college now. I expect you to be good at it. But the thing is that they have not always been told that. And so just highlighting it. If you see your student going really good at something, just saying like, I noticed that you're really good at this. Like, how do we support this? And how do we nurture this, this talent that you have? Um, we have conversations about, uh, what is a good word? So in, in my, with my juvenile justice students, it is, you know, different kinds of business, right? So transferable skills, right? So in the past, you've gotten into some trouble doing some things, you know, selling things. You have really good business and math skills, right? We got to highlight that. Um, or some of my students call it finessing, right? And so I'm good at adapting and understanding what that person would be or what a person would be, um, open to doing. And so I'm going to adapt what I'm wanting from them um, based on who they are. And so that's a skill that's going to benefit you in life, right? And so uh, uh, acknowledging that that's a skill that they can use for their success in the future. Let's use it for positive, right? Um, those are all transferable skills that can be used in the future. And so again, just a trauma-informed pedagogy is understanding how these individuals are impacted by personal and generational histories of harm in order to build awareness and promote healing. So again, I'm not asking educators, I'm not asking for professionals to work on the healing of their students. I'm just asking you to be empathetic to their experiences and just understand that, you know, that that missed assignment um, might be something that is a red flag, you know, maybe reach out, ask them what they're going through. Is there any kind of additional support that they can have? Um, I will tell you that some of the missed assignments that I've come from and given them an opportunity to complete it have become amazing assignments. Once they do complete it, it's a great job, you know? And so um, again, at the end of the day, what are we here for? We're here for a learning and to facilitate that. Um, so trauma-informed approach is basically um, looking to do these four different things. So connect, focus on relationships, right? I wanna be a source of support for you. Yes, I'm here to teach you, but also I want to teach you different kinds of metacognition, right? And so sometimes you might need, if you're not good at something, you might need to figure out a way um, to get that help in advance. So if I know I have a five page paper at the end of my semester, it might be beneficial for you to start working on it now. Maybe you could ask a professor um, for some additional support now so that you have that, that on time, right? So that's a learning opportunity that we want to create that relationship and so that they feel comfortable talking to us about those things. Um, we want to protect promoting safety and trustworthiness. Are our students comfortable enough with identifying themselves as formerly incarcerated with you? And if they do, what do you do with that information? Have you told them that that's okay? You know, um, that's something that we can, we can, I appreciate you telling me that. And, you know, how do you think that that's going to impact your success as a student? Is there something that I can do to facilitate your success in my class? 
Um, I know that historically, um, I've learned from some of the, the formerly incarcerated students that have been speakers on different panel discussions, um, that some students prefer to sit in the back of the classroom just because of their experiences. They don't like people behind them, right? And so something that's gonna foster their success is if you allow them to sit in the back of the classroom. Is that something that I should, is that something um, that is worth having a power struggle over, right? Is it worth it? Is it gonna impact the learning of other people in the environment? So I think it's worth having a conversation. Like I have no problem with you sitting in the back of the classroom as long as you stay focused, as long as you are not disrupting others, as long as you are continuing to be engaged in this class and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? Uh, respect, engaging in choice and collaboration. And so one of the things that we regularly have in my class is that um, we have conversations. I don't mind them having side conversations. When we were going in person, um, one of the things that I had to just make aware of for the probation officers who were in my class, um, please don't get them in trouble for talking. I'm okay with them talking. I like the talking. They're talking about the topic that we're discussing. Please don't get them in trouble. You know, I want to facilitate those discussions, right? So we had a debate one time about, you know, is the is um, juvenile justice or is incarcerating you something that is helpful or harmful, right? And so I had one part, one team um, discussing that it's helpful and one discussing that it's harmful, right? And so they were having a bunch of such robust conversation. And it's so interesting coming from this group of incarcerated kids who are discussing, you know, is this helpful, helping me or is it hurting me? Um, and, you know, they get in trouble because they're talking. I'm like, wait, no, that's what they're supposed to do. Like, I want them to have this conversation and choice, you know? And so then they'll come up with different kinds of activities. Hey, can we debate this, this topic next time? I'm like, yes, absolutely. Like, I love it. At the end of the day, part of this learning is for you to feel like you can have a, pers uh, a say and a mistake, right? And so your ability to debate these topics and your willingness to go and research and have critical thinking about, is this something that is helping me or hurting me? is part of the learning. I love it, right? Um, just, I don't, we don't need to complete the assignments that I made beforehand. We can go back and we can make our own syllabus, right? As long as we're doing the same learning, I don't care what that assignment looks like. Um, redirects, teaching and reinforcing. So again, skill building and competence, understanding that the assignment is just a tool to facilitate the learning, right? And so that might have to be something that we go, we reflect on throughout the semester is understanding that, you know, it might be, the learning might be demonstrated in different ways that is outside of that assignment, right? And so just understanding that those skills that they're building um, is something that um, is most important for the learning. So again, I keep on looking at the time, just make sure we're in there. Um, so um, basically we want to, the benefits of becoming trauma-informed is um, we reduce absenteeism, dropouts, discipline, student behavioral problems, bullying and harassment. And so again, this is not just in P through 12, this is also in higher education. Um, we have improved school culture, staff satisfaction, staff retention, um, and academic achievement, of course, right? Um, so again, this is really just meeting the needs of our students, but part of that is learning what our students' needs are. So not making assumptions about what those needs can be. Asking ourselves, how do we as educators make school more engaging? So I am a very person, I love to talk about, um, yes, I have a doctorate degree, but in my bachelor's degree, I got, I was like so happy to get that C minus in statistics. Like I, I, I was like thrilled, right? Um, statistics is not my strong suit. I am not a math person. I struggled with it so much just because it was not interesting to me. But when I got into my master's degree and took a statistics class specific to psychology and understood that um, there's, there's actual meaning behind those numbers. They're not just random ideas of numbers. Um, I did so well. I got an A in it. I never would have thought. Like my mom was like, are you sure you actually did this work? I'm like, yeah, that was me. That was me. Um, but it's because it was something that I was interested in. So again, facilitating the interest of the students that we serve, identifying like you do really good on this topic, but you don't do good on this topic. You know, is this something that you can make a major? Um, a lot of times people are motivated by money. Um, so I know my students are very much motivated for what's gonna make the most amount of money with the least amount of input. Um, and so I have students who are very good at math and science and they're all about the welding, right? I'm like, yeah, welding is great, temporary. What about becoming an engineer, right? 
Um, yes, you can make a lot of money in welding. Do you know how much money you can make in engineering? Like, I'm totally cool with you. Like, I want to support you becoming a welder. I'll do whatever I need to do. But also, like, you have a lot more potential too, right? Both are great. And I see so many different opportunities for potential. You have, don't limit yourself to one of them. Um, and so just understanding that our interests can be something that we can be most successful in. All right, and so some more resources that we have. Um, again, if you go to Project, Project Implicit, there are different IETs that you can take. Um, there is a book called The Blind Spot that is specific to implicit bias and the impact that we can have on different interventions that we serve. Um, and I also am gonna put this on the website, so don't worry, you'll have access to these resources. Um, there is a, two of those resources, the, the websites are basically on creating trauma-informed classrooms and trauma-informed schools, um, and just gives different tools on how to do that. Um, just because I just briefly went over it, um, I really just wanted to expose you to it, but I'm gonna give you these resources as well. All right, and so is there any questions? I'm sorry I talked so fast. I really just wanted to get through all of the information. I appreciate you being patient with me. Well, Dr. White, thank you. Um, that was just phenomenal. I know that, um, you know, we're all walking away with a wealth of knowledge because of your in-depth clinical perspective. But I want to share with the audience something that you've been very modest. You have done a phenomenal job working. I, I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. White at the Juvenile Justice Campus here at Fresno County and working in the pods with the youth. And what you have done with our youth there has been nothing short of phenomenal. Um, you've accomplished about approximately 75 students now that have gone through dual enrollment with such a positive uh, first impression of post-secondary education because of your approach. I've seen that. Uh, firsthand. And so I want to give you kudos for that. Um, I'm also going to be putting a link in your chat here shortly for um, the evaluation of this workshop. It means a lot to us to have your feedback. So please look for that in the chat box um, here momentarily. And now Alicia Garza, our co-facilitator, is going to lead um, the, uh, the questions that have been uh, posed for you, Dr. White. Alicia? Thank you so much, Renee. I appreciate your, your comments. Um, the students really has been a great opportunity just to learn about different experiences that they've gone through. And it's been super rewarding to see some of them be successful in our Fresno City campus once they transition out of the Juvenile Justice Center. It's been amazing. So I appreciate your support as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so before Renee had said that he was going to give out the survey, I actually put it out as well. So I did label it as first survey one, and the link is in there, like he was talking about, if you could give us feedback. And then... One moment, please, sorry. Are there any questions for Dr. White? Go ahead and just raise your hand. Or not even a question if you just wanna share. Carrie. Hi, Dr. White, thank you so much. That was really a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, as somebody on the Fresno City College who really champions um, our equity work and our equity efforts, I feel like this is kind of a dumb question, so I apologize if it, if it seems like an obvious answer. And I, with the surveys that are done on implicit biases, do you think it's more important to focus on um, white college practitioners in trying to, with equity efforts, or is it just as important to focus on um, people of color when we're doing this work? 
I just want to make sure that I'm understanding your question correctly. Um, are you asking about students that we serve or are professionals? Professionals. So the so colleagues on the college campuses that we're trying to engage in the implicit bias trainings. So I would say that that's absolutely an interesting question and it's a great one um, because um, so I have a super diverse family uh, and um, I have a lot of family members who uh, also have doctorate degrees um, who are grew up with me and different kinds of black family members who only have surrounded themselves around black people. And so they look white, right? Um, and so I think it would be more reflective of, uh, and vice versa, you can have black, black professionals who have not been around white people or black people. It's really just based on your experiences. And that's why I think it's so important um, to take one of those IATs, even just for if you're curious, you know, just to know about it. Um, because we can't really, it's not hard and fast rule, right? And so I, I grew up in Hanford, California, which is uh, predominantly white. I was surrounded by predominantly white people. I even growing up when I went away to college, I was like, black girls can do skydiving. Like what? I didn't know that was something that we were allowed to do. Um, and so I had all these messages and assumptions about what it meant to be a black girl, right? And it's because I didn't have a lot around me. And so I think that it would be more, I think that we would be open to everyone, but also understanding that um, people come from different experiences. And so I think making the assumption that it, it's, it would be most beneficial for our white professionals um, may miss a lot of opportunities for those black indigenous people of color professionals who also would benefit from the information. If that was, if that made sense. Did that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. Dr. White, Jennifer has a question. Jennifer, you can go ahead and ask your question um, or I can read it oh, out. Okay, well, okay. So I'm an instructor at Fresno City College and I, as an adjunct and, and in other universities. And this, this issue is something that's at the forefront of my mind all the time now because of certain incidents and experiences I've had in the last few years with students. But what my question is, is that, you know, a lot of times students, they come to class, they, they leave, and they don't um, interact with me as much. They don't tell me about themselves. And I know now that, and then some do, and some tell me about their experiences and what they're going through and come to me for help. And But what I'm trying to figure out is how to reach those students or how to know which students I need to re reach or be aware of or intervene in some way or give other resources to, but I don't know how to identify them because they don't often come forward or they keep to themselves, you know? So um, that's what I'm trying to really figure out is how to figure out how to reach these students or how to identify the students that are at risk or um, may have been formerly incarcerated and, and need my attention or my intervention or some other tools, you know? So. How do I how do I do that without um, interfering with their own privacy or calling them out in class or you know I mean a survey or I you know I'm not sure if you have any suggestions. Thank you so much for that question and I want to first like validate that and saying that um, I have noticed that it's been more difficult to do so in the virtual environment. I don't know if that's been true for you at all. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so difficult. Um, I think that like in person when I was at the um, working with students at the juvenile justice center, it was much easier to identify like, oh, this person is acting up a little bit. Like I need to do a one-on-one -on -one with them, figure out what's going on, right? Um, but building rapport is always challenging, especially because again, um, you don't know what their experiences have been. And so a lot of times, um, I'll, I'll just say it, like, um, I think that me being a young black woman uh, has been something that has been beneficial for me as far as connecting with the students in the JJC, um, because they feel they've had people in their lives who have looks like me. Um, and so I think that one of the problems is that um, 
they might eat, our students might even have implicit biases about who we are. So it may not even be something that we're doing. We may be super nurturing and supportive and wanting to reach out to them. Um, I think that you have to take the opportunities that are given to you, but if they're holding back, it may just be that they're not ready to share with you yet. You know, um, I think that uh, I'm not sure what you teach, but I've found that writing assignments where I can get them to be a little bit more uh, open to their personal experiences and who they are have been something that I have been able to build rapport with. And so understanding like, oh, you told me that, you know, you in your last writing assignment, you shared that, you know, you were had all this fear and anxiety about being transitioned out because you didn't know where you were going to live. Um, let's talk about that. Like maybe I can help support you with some resources from Fresno City. Um, like I know you were just completing the writing assignment, but like let's talk about that more. You know, that's an opportunity for us to connect. That's, or, that's um, really great. Yeah. And yeah. I'm an English instructor. So they Perfect. have a lot of writing. Perfect. <laughs> yes. I love it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there's so just the other thing. You have to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You so you hit the nail on the head too. So I'm a white uh -huh. woman. And also, I've been very conscious about that and the things that I teach, because I teach all the themes in my class are social justice, and I've been teaching um, Just Mercy, and so we've been talking a lot about the prison system, but trying to connect to my students of color, and, and especially females, especially the ones that are intersectionally challenged, like female mothers and females of color and all these, and not have them see me as that other, you know, like I want to make those connections and that's something I'm struggling and working on all the time. So I don't know, I appreciate this um, session. <laughs> yeah, and no, I think, I think that that even just like you saying that, like it's, that's something that I appreciate, like that would make me feel comfortable coming to you. And it's just like, you know, this is why I have these implicit biases about or I, I know your students aren't going to say this is why I have these implicit biases, but they may say like, this is why I'm not always comfortable connecting with white women because this is what my experience has been in the past. So maybe even saying that, you know, like I really want to connect with all of my students here, but I know that like, especially as we go through like talking about equity work, I may that I know that like you may not be comfortable with me and I want to know how we can bridge that, how we can make it a more com uncomfortable environment. Um, because like even that acknowledgement to me, it's just like, okay, like you really want to work on it. Like I will connect with you kind of thing. Thank you so much for that. Okay, we have about, um, about seven minutes left. Are there, if there are any last minute questions that would like to be posed? I love your comment, uh, Dr. White, and uh, I sincerely appreciate uh, Jennifer's question to you because you know sometimes as instructors you 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 feel a little, you don't want to feel too vulnerable, but at the same time um, you really want to reach out and be genuine to your students. But I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, in in layman's terms, you know, be transparent, be who you are, be genuine. They see that, and uh, I, I think they respond very well. Um, Sean Henderson um, sends the comment, it has been my experience that identifying as formerly incarcerated is rarely seen as a positive in most social situations, including the classroom. Absolutely. And so I want to reflect on Sean, what Sean has said, and it's not Sean's responsibility in the classroom if, as a student to make that environment welcoming to our formerly incarcerated students. So like what as professionals, what can we do to facilitate an environment where that's not something that's seen as negative? That's just an alternative experience that someone has had. Okay, it looks like, um, <clears throat> I don't see any new questions on there, but I do want to reiterate, you have an evaluation link that is in your chat box. And we'd love for you to uh, fill that out. Again, um, attendance is taken through the, the course of this uh, participation, not through chat, but through the actual um, participation in this session. Uh, I also want to reiterate that lunch today will be from 12 to one to uh, traditional lunch hour. 
uh, and we will be reconvening for the second session uh, from 1 to 2.15. And then um, that will be followed by a panel discussion at 2.25. And we'll, we will conclude today between 3.15 and 3.30 with a recognition of Rising Scholars students um, and a closing uh, presentation by Dr. R uh, Ray Ramirez and Dr. Cassandra Little. So, um, Dr. White, it's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, I'm so thrilled uh, that you were able to share. I was just, um, th the golden nuggets that you shared throughout the, the data and the strategies, I think, will serve us all very well. And again, this is being recorded for the benefit of the audience. And so we hope that um, you will take this information and put it to action in the classroom. Thank you so much, Renee. And I, I don't know if I'm even allowed to do this, but I do want to say relying on the resources of people who've done it before. And so one of the reasons why I'm able to connect so well with my students is because I have had the support of Renee, Renee and then also Ms. Gamboa. They've been doing it for a really long time. And so they understand what works and what doesn't. And they are separate from the Ju Juvenile Justice Center. They're educators. And so I, I don't even know if I can do this, but like relying on them, if you can reach out to them and asking, you know, how can we best support our formerly incarcerated students? They have so much expertise on it. They have so much knowledge. They've been doing it for years. They know how to connect with these individuals in ways that I can't even begin to, to articulate. So I just want to give a quick shout out to both of you. I appreciate you so much. You're very gracious. Thank you, Dr. White. Okay, any last minute questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. White. And thank you all for participating in this workshop. And also a shout out to Chelsea and Sierra. I don't, I don't know how you keep up with everybody's um, uh, translation so, so efficiently, but thank you so much for your work today. That is totally awesome. I have my hats off to our interpreters today and also to our co-facilitator today, Alicia Garza. Thank you, Alicia did a fantastic job. <laughs> thank you, I tried my best. Um, thank you for having me and I did enjoy your um, your presentation today. I thought it was very interesting because I did, as a student myself, these were some things that I never really thought about or I never really paid attention, especially like in the classroom. So it was nice to learn a different perspective. Thank you so much, Alicia, I appreciate you. We got some very nice uh, comments for you there, uh, Dr. White. So please enjoy them. You deserve them. And with that, um, thank you, Bill. Thank you all once once again. And we will see you back after lunch. It looks like at uh, one o'clock. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>